Um, welcome everyone. I'm very happy that on this smoky day in Edmonton, we could we could gather here for this conference. I want to wish every one of us happy National Multiple Best Awareness Week. You are all welcome to uh, in 2023 Twin Analytics, which focuses on the multiple best psychosocial health. That is their social and mental well-being. Thank you all for making the time to be here today. We trust that it's going to be a very informative and practically helpful for families of multiples as well as families of single things. But before we dive into the conference, just a few housekeeping um, notes. Uh, I would like all of us to mute when there's a presentation or and there's a discussion so that we can have some orderly kind of um, <laughs> Uh, discussion. So thank you for for keeping that in mind. You're also welcome to send your questions and your contributions to the chat room and the chat room manager will make sure your questions are tabled for addressing. You may also click the raise hand reaction icons if you wish to make a contribution or to ask a question. So uh, we hope that we will all follow these um, little things to make the discussion and the presentations very orderly and useful to all of us. At this point, we would like to ask indeed one of our stellar youth to give us the land acknowledgement. Indeed. Yes. First, we would like to acknowledge God, the maker of heavens and earth, who allocated to every people group on earth their own land and space. And in this same spirit, I acknowledge that I am pleased to be here today. That is in Boma on traditional territory of Treaty 6, the homeland of the Fapres, Aboriginal Band, and the Métis. We would like to thank the diverse Indigenous people whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Nehihal, Denise, Anishinaabe, Soto, Nokosak, Nokosu, and Nishapi, Black people. We also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of one of the largest communities of the Inuit south of the 60th parallel. It is, well, it is a welcoming place for all people who come from around the world to share Boma as a home. We acknowledge all those who share a deep connection with this land. We thank them for sharing its land and its re rich resources with us. We are a treaty people. The peace treaties bind us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, NDD, for uh, giving us the land acknowledgement. Indeed, we are all treaty people. At this point, we, uh, we will um, have the, um, I hope we all sing along, the, because it's National Multiple Based Awareness, just want to sing the national anthem as well. So I will just share it with us. Thank you very much. I just want to give a little introduction to um, today's section. 
in a multiple birth family because we are here for multiple births i just want to explain what multiple births is all about in a multiple birth family parenthood means being a parent to more than one child of the same age at the same time and most often with the same resources time energy finances and family support according to hanenen although some studies found no differences most investigations that compared the mental health outcomes in parents of multiples versus parents of singletons found that the former experienced heightened symptoms of depression anxiety and parenting stress and may experience worse mental health outcomes than the parents of singletons despite increasing public awareness and social political changes that affect paternal parenting culture, fathers still seem to feel undervalued and unsupported in antenatal care, according to Heinonen, 2022. Some people wonder why we celebrate twins, and then in my head, I'm thinking, why should we celebrate you on your birthday? How much more when there are two of you exactly you in twos and threes and fours and fives and on and on so let me go over all the wonderful reasons we work to bring awareness and celebrate multiple beds and their families one in the past myths and superstitions about the origins of multiples have resulted in banishments and or infanticide of multiples in some regions of the world and we hope that through awareness all multiple babies in the world will be protected as some of these superstitions still exist in some regions of the world two having multiples two three or more can bring a lot of joy and a feeling of uniqueness within uniqueness and this uniqueness must be celebrated and acknowledged third number three having multiples also come along with challenges distributing same resources of time energy and sometimes finances among two or more babies at the same time can be challenging fourth globally due to medical advancement the absolute and relative numbers of twins and higher order births are at an all-time high faith regarding the point just made above parents of multiples are reaching out for support tailored specifically to their unique situation for maternity and child health clinics number six reason international research priorities for multiple birth families include the promotion of parenting and family health as well as the competence of professionals both medical and support structures. And the last point is, one of the objectives of the International Council of Multiple Birth Organizations is to promote the principles detailed in the Declaration of Rights and Statement of Need of Twins and Higher Order Multiples. It states that whereas the conception and care of multiples increase their health and psychosocial risk of their families, and whereas genetics, genetic factors, fertility drugs, and in vitro fertilization techniques are known to promote multifetal pregnancies, a individuals or couples planning their families and or seeking infertility treatment have the right to be fully informed about one factors which influence the conception of multiples, two the associated pregnancy risks. And treatment. Three, the associated risks to one, more, or all of the fetuses or infants. Fourth, the facts regarding parenting multiples. And finally, the option of multifetal pregnancy reduction along with its associated risk and profound emotional consequences. Number two, infertility treatment should intend to prevent multiple pregnancies, in particular, high-order multiples. 
And thirdly, fertility services should disclose their number of multiple pregnancies, both intentional and unintentional. The couple seeking infertility treatment must, must be aware of all these things. They are right to know these things. This is just the introduction. We have better experts here who are going to walk us through the importance of um, helping or attending to the psychosocial health of multiple birth fathers. So here to help us introduce our panelists today is Eva and Fred. First, we'll call upon um, um, Eva. But before we do that, I just want to warm us up with Thank you very much for sharing in this little fun. So we now call on Eva to introduce our panelists. Hello everyone and welcome. So our first panelist is Dr. Ekua Agiman. Um, she is a public health and preventative medicine senior resident physician at the University of Alberta. She is trained in Ghana and worked as a primary care physician before moving to Canada. She serves as the president of the Black Residents and Fellows of Canada on the Black Physicians of Canada Board and as the Deputy National Women's Ministry Leader of the Church of Pentecost Canada. She is passionate about working to promote the health of vulnerable populations through healthy public policies which address the various determinants of health and inequity. So Dr. Ajman is married to Mr. Emmanuel Ajman with three children. She enjoys the outdoors with her family and friends, volunteering with her community when she is not working. She owes everything she is and will her be to her Lord Jesus. So our next panelist today is Patty Walker. So Patty Walker is an RN with a passion for supporting families that have experienced baby loss. As a public health nurse, she was drawn towards families in the community. Then from her own personal experiences, she started to attend one of the local pregnancy loss support groups, Parent Care, eventually becoming a facilitator for the group for over 25 years. Patty has her death and grief certificate from Dr. Alan Wolfbelt, result, sorry, resolved through sharing certificate and holding space for pregnancy loss certificate. Currently, she supports families at the time of loss and often for years later, often becoming part of the village of support. Patty is always available to support families that have lost one or more multiples. She also supports families as they parent surviving multiples, all while acknowledging the siblings that have passed. When not supporting families, Patty is at home with her husband Cam of almost 35 years and a crazy household of two cats and a dog, or traveling to Vancouver to visit with their daughter Anastasia. Thank you, Eva. Um, we'll, we'll call on Fred to introduce the next two on the panel. Fred? Our next two panelists, are, uh, the first is Mary Olu Conton. Mary is a registered nurse with a range of clinical experiences, including general medicine and maternal slash newborn birth. 
She's currently a doctoral student in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. Her doctoral work examined across access to health services and support for Black pre-term infants in the community setting. Broadly, her research interests include maternal and child health, immigrant health, and the health and well-being of Black populations. Mary is particularly interested in critical qualitative inquiry that explores how interesting how intersection societal identities influences access, health, and well-being. Our other uh, panelist is Joe and Lindsay Deprose. <coughs> Joe and Lindsay Deprose, let's give a hand on our applause for uh, our uh, panelists. The depots are funding uh, participants of the Twin First Edmonton Parade and Festival since it started seven years ago. They are here to tell you all you need to know as an expectant multiple birth father slash grandfather or male relatives. We will all welcome, you are all welcome to the uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. So we'll hand over to the moderator of the uh, conference today, Dr. Ikwa Ajiman, to take over. Hey, thank you so much, Auntie Flora. And welcome everyone to today's symposium on twin bed. Yes, so the theme today is about the mental health of fathers, but we are not leaving the mothers and people who are aspiring to be parents of twins out because I know there's a couple of people here who are hoping that maybe we'll talk about how you can make twins or how you can get twins. But yeah, definitely we'll get there. So uh, I just want you to know that the number of multiple pregnancies is uh, actually rising in proportion to all pregnancies. And again, this can be attributed to um, assisted conception because that is on the increase. And also, multiple pregnancies carry high risk of ad adverse fetal and neonatal outcomes and it has serious consequences for the child as well as uh, families and the healthcare system so um myself i always wanted to have twins but after i had my first child and it was a single thing i actually thank god that i didn't get twins i was like god i don't know what i would have done if I had to do two of this at the same time, even one, I didn't know how to manage that. So really hats off to all parents of twins, you are doing an amazing job, right? Because compared with singletons, babies from multiple pregnancies have a higher rate of preterm birth. They have uh, perinatal mortality as well as longer term uh, de developmental issues. And apart from that, even during the pregnancy, so if a woman uh, vomits during pregnancy, it's kind of doubled during um, multiple beds. Everything is double, right? If your feet gets swollen, it gets double. So it's it's really amazing that uh, people are actually able to do that, especially the natural ones, it just blows my mind. And unfortunately, because of all the challenges that come with multiple beds, sometimes we have higher mortality among multiples and Again, they might be born earlier than expected, and um, some of them might actually be still born. And then also because of the gestational age, sometimes their delivery can also be complicated. So it's uh, when you see twins and they are born, they are alive, they are well, it's such a miracle that we should definitely be celebrating them for today. So thank you all for coming once again. And um, to our topic for today, the father of the father factor, right? Multiple bed pregnancies and multiple care. We are trying to understand how twin fatherhood um, needs support. Usually we talk about the mothers, but we don't talk about the fathers. So I hope that at the end of our discussion today, you will learn something that you can use to support your partner should you have twins as uh, you probably anticipating that you would okay so our first panelist is um uh, mary olukoton and then we'll hand over to her for her presentation and if you have any questions feel free to note them down or just put them in the chat 
and as we go along we'll address them so mary please take it away okay do i have the capability to share my screen laura I've enabled it, so it should be able to share. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I Good hope afternoon. you are not in Edmonton, where it is smoky with poor air quality. I hope you're sorry you have some fresh air and you're able to get some sun today. Because where I'm at it is all windows closed, no fresh air for us here in Edmonton. All right, love my slides. I feel like between Flora and Equa, they've pretty much summarized everything I'm going to share in my presentation, but hopefully I still have some additional insights to provide. Okay. All right. So as Flora introduced, um, today we're here celebrating swing and multiple pregnancies and births, particularly focusing on the experiences of um, fathers as a partner of multiple um, multiples here. So my name is Mary. I am a second year doctoral student in the Faculty of Nursing at University of Alberta going into my third year. Um, as I was introduced earlier, my expertise is primarily maternal and child health. Um, I also look into um, just pregnancy and birth in general and then the health of Black populations, immigrant populations, and just intersections of social identities and how they um, how it affects access to healthcare, social supports, social services, things like that, etc. So I don't have a lot of expertise in terms of speaking about the experiences of fathers. I'm not a father. Um, so I will say that um, I do like to I do like to say that those that are experts in a topic are those um, that have the lived experience in that topic. So I'm speaking here from the experience of a nurse, a researcher, um, as someone who has a father, as someone who has a spouse who's a father, um, but I, I am not the expert here. Those with the lived experiences are the experts on this topic. So this is just a brief outline of what I'll be reviewing today. Um, I think it's important to discuss positionality when we're talking about any topic, because our identities do affect how we perceive um, situations, how we perceive experiences, how we interact with others on a daily basis. So I always like to start with that. And then I'll just review some current statistics, some of which Flora has already mentioned, as well as Aqua on Equa. Um, so I won't spend too much time there. Then I'll just talk about multiple pregnancy and births, social and mental well-being, intersectionality, with this, which is important to any topic. And then just what's next in terms of where, where do we need to go in terms of research, in terms of policy or practice when we're discussing multiple pregnancy and births. So to begin, um, these are just some of my identities. So I'm a black woman, I'm married, I'm a new mother. Uh, I have a three month old, so I, I can't say I can relate to some of the experiences of multiple parents, but with just one baby, I can only imagine what it's like having two, three, four babies to take care of all in one go. Um, I'm a registered nurse, a researcher, a settler immigrant. I'm English speaking, I'm educated, and I consider myself middle class. So these identity, identities essentially inform um, how, I, how I engage with the world and um, how I engage with research and any topics that I approach in research. So just some brief statistics. And it was really interesting when I was preparing for this presentation, there isn't, there isn't a lot of data in Canada about multiple pregnancies and births. In fact, Flora actually sent me some articles, which I appreciated, um, because even worldwide, there isn't a lot of research that's being done on this topic. And so right off the bat, I, I think it's important that we're having these conversations and that we're gathering as a community to have these conversations because we do need more awareness to this topic um, because families, multiple family, multiple pregnancy and birth families, and then their fathers as well. They deserve more attention. They deserve more support. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then they just deserve more, um, 
more services within the community as well. Because even within Canada, from like a brief Google search, there aren't a lot of services available that cater specifically to the needs of families um, of multiples. Um, so that was really interesting to, to discover while I was preparing. So in the United States, as Flora said, um, the rates of multiple pregnancies and births have continued to increase over the past several decades. As of right now, 300 births are multiples. And then in Canada, one in every 30 births is a multiple. And um, the statistics show that 97% of multiple births are twins. Um, and worldwide, the twin birth rate is up 70% since 1980. And the statistics show that this went up from nine in 1,000 births to 12 in 1,000 births. And accordingly, the birth rate for triples and other higher order multiples have increased as well over the past several decades. Now, this has since slowed down um, in 1998 for, for higher order multiples compared to twins, um, just due to some increased policy in the management of like, in vitro fertilization and things like that. But the general trend has been an increase over the past several decades. Um, so when we talk about multiple pregnancy, um, simply put, it's pregnancy with two or more fetuses, so twins, triplets, quadruplets, etc. And um, as we discussed previously, this has increased over time due to one, more people having babies later in life. So older, older, older women are more likely to to have twins or multiples compared to younger women. And so we see a trend in the past several years of people waiting until later and later in their life to have children, which has resulted in more um, multiple births. And interestingly enough, um, white women, especially those who are older than 35, has the highest rates of um, multiple, higher order multiple births, so triplets or more. In addition to people having babies um, later in life, We've also seen an increase in the use of assisted reproductive technologies, so in vitro fertilization and things like that. Um, and this is mostly due to in the 1960s, 1970s, you know, medical advancements, technological advancements um, introduced IVF, and from there we see the increase in um, through IVF, we see the increase in multiple pregnancies as well. Other factors related to multiple pregnancies, genetics. So if you are a twin yourself, if your mom's a twin, if there are twins in your family, you're more likely to have a twin yourself. Older age, like I mentioned, higher parity. So that means that if you've had a previous pregnancy, um, a consequent pregnancy is more likely to be twin than if you haven't been pregnant before. And then race. So in addition to white women, older than 35, having the highest rates of higher order multiples, um, African-American women are more likely to have twins than any other race, which I thought was a really interesting fact. Um, and then on the other end, Asian women are least likely to have twins. And I didn't get too much into the, the science of why that is, um, but yeah, those are just really interesting facts that I came across. Okay, next slide here. I'm already at seven minutes. Okay, I won't, I won't talk too much for each slide. Um, so when we're talking about the social and mental well-being um, of families of multiples, there, it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult time. There are lots of shifts, lots of challenges in parenthood in general, um, or just a singleton. So this is more, this becomes more complex when you have multiples. There's greater physical demands, there's more babies, you need more energy, It's you need more time, more efforts to take care of more babies. Um, the psychosocial challenges are more defined as well. You just, you're fatigued, you don't have the same capacity to, to be as social, you don't have the same capacity to, um, what's the word, to contribute, to be engaged with all your other relationships when you have multiple babies to take care of. There are the financial challenges of just having more babies who have more needs to take care of as well. Um, the routines are, are challenging to adjust to balancing the multiple demands of multiple babies. You only have twins, it's not like you're doing the exact same thing for each baby. Each twin might still have their own preferences. So you're, you're learning 
multiple routines for multiple babies at the same time. So you're balancing the needs of multiple babies, the workload of having multiple babies. And so all of this just puts families at increased risk for poor mental health. There are a lot of changes, a lot of shifts happening all at once. You're exhausted, you haven't slept well in days and weeks. So there's significant risk for poor mental health and social well-being. Um, I feel like I should have put this earlier on, but when we talk about um, IVF as one of the reasons that we're seeing increased rates of multiple pregnancies and births. So this is from the literature. I pulled these from the literature. Um, lots of discourse in the media lately about the management of reproduction and what is considered life and at what points do we consider life to be human. And so while I won't get into, the, into a discussion on that, we have to acknowledge that that discussion is not separate from a lot of the discussions on ethics of IVF, because when there are discussions about ethics or morality of IVFs, it's a matter of people saying, well, who are we to intervene with what's nature and wh where do we draw the line with medical intervention and things like that, etc. Other issues or concerns is informed consent. How, how informed are families when they're making decisions or when they're being educated by healthcare providers, by service providers? What is the extent of the information that they're being provided um, when they're making the decisions about their, um, their, their reproductive um, uh, plans? Um, parental motivation is also a concern for some service providers. And then there's genetic screening. It's like, where do we draw the line with um, selection of certain traits, um, such as sex or other traits in, in the embryos that are selected for implantation? And then also like storage or management of surplus embryos. So we're going back to that discussion of at what points do we consider um, embryo to be life or not life? And what are we doing with the ones that aren't implanted? Um, Flora, I'm already at 10 minutes. Do I just keep going? Yes, please. Yes, okay. please. <laughs> okay. Um, so we could talk a lot about each of these points when we're discussing ethics or morality and like look, some of these aren't specific to just um, conversations about reproductive management. We can expand these to other areas of health and access as well. Um, I will just move on to my next slide. And so getting straight to what we're here for. So when we're talking about the social and mental well-being of fathers of multiples, as discussed previously, there's a lot of changes. There are a lot of changes happening all at once in a very short time frame. A lot of demands um, on, on parents to care for multiples. So the research shows that there are poor mental health outcomes um, in the postpartum period and in early parenthood um, for fathers of multiples. Fathers of multiples also experience more parenting stress at three months postpartum than fathers of singletons. Fathers of high school mature twins report marginally more <clears throat> anxiety after hospital discharge um, compared to fathers of high risk singletons. And, and this is just things I pulled from the literature. And so I found that depending on which article you read, <laughs> depending on the article you read, how they measured mental and social well-being, the points at which they measured mental and social well-being. There was some, there were variances in the literature about the degree um, or the extent to which fathers of multiples experienced um, poorer or better social and mental well-being. So I did find one article that said that there was actually no difference in the rates of depression or anxiety um, fathers of multiples experienced, like in the second trimester of pregnancy compared to um, fathers of singletons. Um, but most of the literature indicated that they were at risk for poorer outcomes. However, by two months postpartum, um, fathers of twins reported more symptoms of depression than fathers of singletons. And these differences persisted um, up to 24 months postpartum. So two years, two years into parenthood um, where these fathers experience more symptoms of depression 
and more symptoms of anxiety compared to fathers of singletons. So just from based on the variances in the literature in terms of um, consistency across all the studies, what comes to mind is that this is definitely an understudied area. We need more standardization of how we're approaching um, studies looking into the social and mental well-being of fathers of multiples because there's just a lot of inconsistency um, and the conclusions um, the conclusions weren't always exactly clear depending on how the metrics were assessed. And so some of the signs of poor psychosocial well-being that we'll sometimes see in fathers, um, and I just say fathers and not fathers of multiples, because in fathers of multiples, it might be to a higher degree, but between fathers of singletons and fathers of multiples, these are still the same signs and symptoms that we'll see. So irritability, anxiety, anger, frustration, Changes in appetite, which is an interesting one because as anyone who's a parent knows that your appetite, your appetite changes and it's, it's not by choice. Sometimes you just don't have time to, to get those full meals in. Um, feeling helplessness, depressed mood, feelings of isolation, withdrawal, um, increasing risk-taking behavior. And an interesting one, which I, I hadn't thought about is escape activities. So fathers will spend more time at work to avoid being home to the care of the babies or they'll find excuses to not be at home just due to the stress and the um the the negative feelings that they have in their home feelings of guilt maybe um being home and caring for the babies so that is a, a significant one um that i i didn't expect to come across that i thought was interesting And then in terms of um, differences between mothers and fathers, so fathers of multiples, um, they experience many of the same, the same shifts, the same challenges that mothers of multiples experience. Um, you know, the, the role disruption, um, social isolation, sleep deprivation. There was one study that found that fathers of multiples might even have greater sleep loss than mothers, um, at least during the, the most immediate postpartum period, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then between mothers and fathers, there are actually similar patterns of, of mental health outcomes at most points um, postpartum. And um, the data also indicate that some fathers might actually experience um, similarly levels of um, of postpartum stress, of depression, um, of the stress as mothers of multiples as well. But however, um, there was one article that said that mothers of twins experience more distress and poorer well-being than their spouses. So once again, across the literature, it, it depends on the specific topic that's being addressed, how the topic is addressed, then the time period, whether it's you know, immediate postpartum or later postpartum, um, that social and mental well-being is being assessed as well. And then I'll briefly talk about intersectionality. So no two families are the same. Um, two families with twins don't have the same experience. Each family is unique in the structures and their dynamics. And so that's no difference in families of multiples and how they navigate the care of the multiples and how they navigate access and how they navigate their their um, their need for support services, etc. Um, and from an intersectionality perspective, um, other other aspects of social identities um, also impact um, how parents navigate parenthood and how. Um, when they're seeking supports and services, how they interact with the systems and the institutions that they're engaging with. So for example, individuals with different gender identities will have different experiences of parenting. And so while we're talking about social and mental well-being, women and men may experience social and mental well-being differently. So that's also something that wasn't very well identified in the literature is we're using 
these um, these statistical tools to assess for social and mental well-being when there's also a, an aspect of social and mental well-being that can't really be be quantified. Um, so that's definitely an area for further investigation in the research. Um, but going back to what I was saying, so individuals with different gender identities will have different experiences of parenting, of parenthood, and this also is reflected in how they access care and other services. Um, one of the reasons that is, is because there are biases, unfortunately, that exist in, um, in how people not only engage, but in, um, in the systemic um, aspect of institutions as well. Um, there are gender biases, there are racial biases. Um, in terms of language, there aren't enough services to offer um, language supports for some families. Um, other social identities impact the types of access people receive as well. So educational attainment, someone who has um, more education might have better healthcare literacy and they're able to advocate for themselves better so they may get better care than someone else who has lower educational atten attainment. So things like socioeconomic class comes into play as well, or immigrant status also come into play as well. All these factors and identities impact how people are able to access care, how they're able to receive care and the quality of care that they receive. This also goes to the types, the amounts, and ranges of supports that are available to various populations as well. And then just to sum up, so like I said earlier, a lot of the literature um, that I came across was from the United States. Um, there were also some articles from other higher income Western countries. So Switzerland, um, the UK, I think I saw something from Australia, but the data is very behind in terms of research on this topic. And there are a lot of inconsistencies in the literature. So I think that just goes back to the types of tools that are being used to measure for social and mental well-being, and then the different points in time that these measurements are being taken. So that's definitely uh, an area for further investigation. Um, we need to assess for more predictors of poor mental health in parents of multiples. So a lot of the liter literature does say, okay, parents of multiples are at greater risk for poor mental well-being, or there are certain things that we can identify during maybe the antepartum or prenatal period that we can use to mitigate the risk for poor mental um, and social well-being postpartum. I also found that there was not a lot, in fact, I didn't come across anything, any research on family structures that are, you know, outside of the male and female family structure. So more research is needed on the experiences of gender diverse families, complex mixed families and other family arrangements because those families too also experience multiple pregnancies and births. And then lastly, more research could be done on racial and ethnic differences in social and mental well-being of parents and multiples, and then also maybe cultural impacts of managing the demands of parents and multiples, because there's different family structures, different ways that different cultures approach, you know, parenthood and supporting families. And it'd be interesting to see how those also change the social and mental well-being outcomes of parents as well. And that is it for me. I definitely went over my time, but I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to speak. Thank you for uh, Thank you so much, Mary. We really appreciate the information. This, this was really helpful to understand the evidence and what the literature says about twin beds and uh, twin pregnancies. And um, I just hope that we haven't discouraged you if you are still trusting God for twins. <laughs> it's not all gloomy. As we go along, we have parents of twins who are actually enjoying their twins and we'll give them opportunity to share with us as well. So we open the, the floor for questions. Does anyone have questions about what Mary said? Yeah, one thing that's obvious that we definitely need more uh, database and information on twins, spe specifically with regards to the fathers. 
to help us understand what is going on with them much more, right? Okay, um, hearing none. Okay, in the in the sake of time, we'll I, have, I have a I have a okay. Okay, please okay. go ahead. I, I have a quick question, um, and I, I, I agree with the choir that we, we shouldn't uh, maybe it shouldn't be that we discouraging people. But uh, would you want to comment on what I would term the, the happiness index of having a twin or multiple births? How it also helps uh, in the side of mental health. I I did come across one article. It spoke specifically to fathers' experiences of caring for their infants. So a lot of fathers feel a great sense of fulfillment and accomplishments when they're allowed to be involved in the care of their babies. And I think sometimes um, in the literature, we focus a lot on, you know, when we talk about families and um, the care of babies, we focus a lot on mothers' experiences. But fathers too also have needs in, in caring for their babies as, as parents. And I think there needs to be more, maybe from service providers, more encouragement or more um, support in encouraging fathers to also be more involved in the care, in the care of their babies. That, that was one of the positive things I did see in the literature is that fathers are actually happy to be involved. Um, and then on the other end, when they are not as involved, they do feel kind of left out or isolated from the parents and experience. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I guess that answers it. So, I mean, twins are doubles, right? If you have a bouncing baby boy or girl and you are so full of joy, you have two of them at the same time, you really will enjoy them. So it's just the initial stages that appears that is difficult, but once they start growing and you start showing them off, the joy is uh, double as well. So um, we will go to uh, Patty Walker. She has so much experience uh, supporting families who unfortunately lose one or two of their multiples. And again, as I said earlier on, during my, my practice, um, most of the miscarriages, most of them were like because of uh, twin pregnancies. So it's actually high risk, but once uh, you know, you hold on to your faith, God helps you, you deliver them, it's also double joy. So yeah, we'll just go on to Paddy and hear about her experiences as well. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Um, can I get the screen sharing? Yes, you can. Thank you. I'm gonna let you know I'm, I'm sometimes technically challenged, so. I don't know if it's on my end sometimes. All right. So you can go ahead, please. Um, yeah, I still don't see where I can. Uh, sh uh, let me see if I can. OK, so you, you. OK, I can. I've got it now. Thank you. You got it. OK, thanks. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to speak this afternoon on supporting the bereaved father in the loss of one of our multiples. Um, sadly, sometimes, as we know, um, and has been said, when there is a multiple birth pregnancy, not all the babies survive. And um, as Mary said, there isn't a lot of research on this, um, and there's especially not a lot of research um, for the dads. And so a lot of what I will talk about is the personal experience that I've had as well. So I've had a passion for supporting families that have lost a baby for many years. So often when there is a loss of a child in a family, everyone focuses on the woman. But dads are also so important to acknowledge. They will grieve differently, and that is okay. There's no recipe for grief. There's no timeline for grief. And everyone will be unique in their experience. To lose a child is one of the greatest pain a parent can endure. The death of a twin adds another dimension to this tragedy. 
Although each twin is an individual, from the moment a couple finds out that they're expecting multiples, they might have been inseparable babies in their minds and in their hearts. When one of the babies dies, they're not only trying to cope with their own grief, but in addition, they're trying to support the surviving baby or babies as they grow, as well as other children in their family. The whole mystique of multiples is lost. Their dreams of seeing what that special bond grow between the children will not happen as they had hoped. So there's many different emotions felt. As I said, grief is a journey that does not have an end. The family have not only lost a baby, they've also lost the hopes and dreams they had for raising twins or triplets or higher multiples. Both parents will feel many emotions. Some of the emotions dad, that dads may feel are shock and confusion. Finding out that one of the babies died may leave the dad feeling numb. His thinking may not be clear. He may be asking how could this possibly have happened, even if they knew in advance that this might have been a possibility. There's also that uh, loss of control. The dad did not get to control what was happening to their babies. They may feel a sense of helplessness because they could not prevent this from happening. Anger, sadness, guilt, or disappointment are often expressed in the form of anger. Although feeling angry is normal, it is really important to find healthy ways of directing that anger. Many men will find activities that are done by themselves. For example, running or whacking a golf ball or shoveling snow or whatever. But it's important that they do something to release these emotions. There can also be some frustration of fr or failure. Many men have been wired or socialized to fix things. Losing a baby cannot be fixed. This can lead to feelings of helplessness and possibly even hopelessness. So it's really important that they build that village of support. Sadness, it's not an emotion that anybody likes. Yet being sad is also the price of love. If they did not love their baby so much, it would not hurt so much. So how do you balance that joy of a surviving baby while honoring the baby that you've lost? So it's okay to be sappy, to be happy and sad at the same time. The one thing I always want to stress to families, it's important to remember that all your feelings and all your emotions are valid. They're yours, they're real, and they sometimes suck, but they're never ever wrong and we need to support those. So one of the things that's important to do is to acknowledge the baby that died. It's important to acknowledge that the baby that has survived or the babies that have survived were multiples. So some of the language that we can use is really important to acknowledge that this is a twinless twin, a surviving twin or triplet, or even a lone twin. I don't know if any of you read the series, um, the book, The Series of Unfortunate Events. And I remember reading that to my daughter when she was young. And in there, there were two um, siblings, but they were actually surviving triplets. And in the children's book, they acknowledged that they were surviving triplets. And I thought that was so wonderful that they acknowledged that there was another child in that part of their story, another sibling as part of their story. The surviving twin will be a constant reminder of the one who died. This may have been particularly pertinent if they were identical, because but all twins were born as two halves of one miraculous arrival. I truly believe twins and triplets are all miraculous, whether they're conceived naturally or the result of fertility treatment. Always say the baby's name. Nothing sounds more beautiful or acknowledging than hearing the name of the baby or the babies that died along with the babies that survive. One of the things that we can do in the hospital is we have a purple butterfly program. Often when a multiple uh, gestation pregnancy um, is, um, comes about, some of the babies will end up in the NICU. And so one of the things that happens is that a purple butterfly is put on the isolate. And that lets the staff know that this is a multiple pregnancy and also gives the permission to talk about the babies that passed as well. 
So how do you move forward, which is never getting over? Any major event for the surviving children, no matter how joyous, may also bring the loss into sharper focus, knowing that two or more of their children should be present. Occasions such as birthdays, the first day of school, graduation, passing a driver's test, graduating from university, a wedding, a birth of a grandchild, can make a dad feel the loss more keenly and resurface those emotions. So again, give permission to feel the feelings. What can be helpful to find ways to include the baby is to include the baby that passed. One dad that I had supported had really identified with a certain sports team. And so he had visions of teaching his son how to play baseball. He had those hopes and dreams even before those babies were born. And when his little boy passed, he wanted to make sure that his little boy was always acknowledged. So for every family photo, every special occasion, he included the logo. And on the first birthday of the twins, in some of the pictures, he had his daughter dressed up in that team logo. And this was his way of connecting to his son, as well as his daughter, and also allowing his daughter to be connected to her brother that she had lost. So again, as Mary said, there is not a lot of um, uh, literature and stuff for um, multiple births. Uh, some, and especially for your dads, and then it even gets smaller for um, when you're looking for the bereaved father. Even in um, the pregnancy loss community, there's not a lot of stuff for bereaved dads, which hurts my heart because it's not just the woman that has lost these babies, it's also her partner as well. But one of my favorite books that I've heard from uh, multiple dad losses uh, is a book called Coming to Term, and it's a father's story of birth, loss, and survival. And it's a very poignant story of a couple's first pregnancy with twins, a premature birth and an early neonatal death of one of the twins and the long hospitalization of the survivor before coming home. It's told from the father's point of view and it chronicles the facts and the emotions and the decisions in coping through the family's long ordeal. It gives a really honest and revealing look at one family's experience with a mixed outcome from a multiple birth. There's another wonderful book that's called From Father to Father, Letters from Lost Dad to Lost Dad. And I've been um, blessed by given, been gifted quite a few copies of this. So if anybody would like a copy of this book, just let me know and I will very happily pass it along. It's a simple book of letters written for lost dads from other lost dads who are living and surviving after the death of their precious child. Fathers from all around the world share letters of love from their hearts with the hope that maybe in the darkest, loneliest hours of grief, dads will find a little bit of comfort in the words of another father that has been there. Too often, as I said, a father's grief and experience of loss is overshadowed or unacknowledged after the death of their children. So this book does offer acknowledgement and gives voice to the experience of fathers grieving their children. The father speaking through these pages offers support and recognition to let dads know that they are not alone. Another one of my favorite books is Sam and Finn. It's from the UK and it's actually a children's book and it is for the surviving um, twin, twin or triplet. But it is a one way that you can personalize and have your baby's names attached to it and whether it was a boy or a girl. And um, it's a way that the children can then continue to have that relationship with their sibling that is gone. There's a few supportive websites that I found that will speak to um, pregnancy loss and all of them have a little, some of them very small sections for dads. A lot of them are out of the UK, which I also find very interesting. The UK, as far as pregnancy loss goes, is miles, the UK and Australia are miles ahead of what we have even in Canada and the United States. But a couple of the good uh, um, support sites are Center for Loss and Multiple Births, which is called CLIMB multiple births canada um, there's also the pregnancy and infant loss support center pilsk which is based out of calgary and they have a variety of um, support groups and they do have one for loss of multiples when i researched it it tended to be more women that attended that but i know they're very open to welcoming dads but they also do have a specific dad loss support group 
There's another uh, website called Raising Multiples and one called Jamal. The only specific um, group that I found for twins, again, based out of the UK, was Twins Trust. And they did have a small section for dads as well. I guess the important thing to acknowledge is that lo losing a multiple is not what anybody envisioned. And it can be very lonely. It's a very crappy club that people join when they lose babies. But there's such beautiful support in there. And it's a safe place when you create that village of support to be able to talk about your babies that have survived with joy and also the babies that have passed also with joy because life, death ends a life it doesn't end a relationship we still have a relationship with our children after they are gone so the one thing i just wanted to point out there that if anybody needs to reach me for any reason um this is um not my work email I, it is my support group email and you're very welcome to reach me there or call me by phone um so i'm here to support families especially dads um and if they have ever any questions in the loss of their babies so i guess i would then ask is there any questions Yes, thank you so much, Paddy. That's what's really insightful. So I'm just wondering, um, can you maybe tell us if you have the stats or just a rough idea of how often we lose twins in Edmonton? Um, the specific stats, I'm not sure. One in four pregnancies will end. And um, the number of multiples are it, well, it's obviously much higher. Majority are um, under the 12 weeks as miscarriages, as you had mentioned. Um, and that is often because for genetic reasons, unfortunately. When there is the um, assisted reproductive technology, that also can get very complicated, that there can be um, maybe two or three little embryos that are implanted, but only one survives. But if that family is viewing those as their babies, that also needs to be um, uh, acknowledged as well. Okay. There's not a lot of data. Uh, Priscilla has asked us, is there data on how the death of a twin affecting the surviving twin as they grow? The Most of the research that I saw is um, to really for the surviving twin or triplet to acknowledge that they were from a multiple pregnancy because a lot of the research and some of them are anecdotal studies um, the families or the babies that have um, even as they come adults and they find out that they were from a multiple pregnancy they'll always say that they're always felt something was missing and they feel very um, anybody that I've ever spoken to has felt very um, saddened that their family had not let them know about that thing. There are some, when I was doing the research, um, especially looking for support groups, there are a couple of support groups for adult twinless twins so that they can support each other as they are missing their twin as, as well. But I don't have the specific um, statistics. I apologize for that. No worries. Okay, do we have any more? There's questions? another question in the chat, so if you could. Uh, oh, sorry, that was a question in the chat. Yes, I apologize. Yeah. And Joseph, I agree with you. Please say your baby's names. That is just so powerful to hear other people say your baby's names and for us to say our baby's names. One of the things for the support group that I run is um, a lot of it times it's virtual and people put their names on who they are but they also put their baby's names behind so we can also see their baby's names as well thank you joseph there's one more there's one more question there's, a, there's another question before joseph's oh i think buddy answered that one Patty answered that one mm -hmm. yeah so now it's time to go on to hear the real life story but before we hear about uh we hear from the twin parents we have online with us today 
I, as I was preparing for this, I spoke to a colleague of mine. So uh, this couple, they are all physicians and they had a twin just in February. And I was like, okay, so how did you feel when you realized you were going to uh, have twins? Being a physician, delivering babies, knowing that this was a seriously high risk <laughs> pregnancy, how were you feeling about it? And then he took me back a little bit. He was like, oh, his wife, the other physician, she's also a physician practicing. She's always wanted twins. So a little bit of background, they have two grown boys already. The, the younger one is seven years. And then the lady had to do her residency. So when she completed, she still wanted to have her twins. Like she was so determined about it, right? She had written the names of the twins. If they are girls, this is what she's going to call them. If they were boys, this is what she was going to call them. So she took seed and the first time she went by herself to the physician and the ultrasound showed one. So she was very disappointed. She came home and still kept on to her faith, confessing that she's going to have twins, calling that one baby in her womb by the two names, saying that they are two. So the next ultrasound, she went with her husband and then and this time a technician did it and was like, congratulations, you're going to have twins. So I was like, wow. <laughs> so they were so excited. She was just overjoyed. And I, I, I just asked them because like we, we all study in medical school. We know that you probably throw up more. Everything is more, like I said, and coupled with that is a risk of you know, losing them or preterm delivery and all that. Anyway, she carried to term. I saw her like a week before she delivered and she was really heavy, but she, she went ahead, had them. So this was natural conception, had them naturally, and they were just excited. So I was like, okay, so now caring for the babies, how do you feel? It was like, oh, I want to feel left out, but I am not left out. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? So he brought in uh, his mom and then his sister. And then he was like, so in the morning, I leave the house. In the night, I come back. <laughs> and then uh, at night, if the babies are crying, I help to feed them. So that is how he's coping with it. That's how he's dealing with it. He still needs that space. He's still trying to come to terms with it. And gradually, he will stay home more, I believe. So uh, people react differently right? They respond differently, though they're excited and happy about it. Sometimes the reality of not sleeping through the whole night, waking up feeling cranky, and you still have work to do, is real. So without uh, wasting much time, let's go on to hear about the experience of Joe and Lindsay, their pros. So yeah, please take it away. Hello everyone, we just want to say thank you, first of all, for having us on today. And we're actually the parents of triplets. So we are here to discuss what the signs of multiple birth, or what the signs of the father of multiples is doing well socially or mentally, and signs that he's not doing well. Uh, so, <laughs> well most, sorry, I'm just a little bit choked up here from Patty's presentation. Sorry. <laughs> Um, while most of the prenatal and antenatal care and concern is concentrated on the mothers, the fathers have social and mental needs as well. Positive signs that a father is doing well are that he feels confident in his ability to tackle life and fatherhood. He appears genuinely happy and relaxed when tasked with caring for his children. Being a patient and positive role model for their children is also another sign that the father of multiples is doing well socially and mentally. Of course, he will experience bouts of uncertainty and fears, but he will find ways undoubtedly to overcome and conquer these tribulations. Men who are present in their children's and spouses' lives and are able to see themselves in an active and equal parenting role may communicate their feelings about fatherhood more openly with their partner, creating a higher reassurance and, and positivity within their role. So what are the signs that a father is not doing well mentally or socially? One sign is the way he interacts with his family over many different scenarios and with the different people around. For example, is he withdrawn from a seemingly happy situation? This can be a big indicator. 
For instance, the children are engaged in that activity and smiling, and the mother is smiling and attentive, but the father looks sad, emotionless, or even heated without reason. Another sign is a change in his personality. Did he used to be a fun-loving guy with many interests, and now he is quick to anchor anger and showing little interest in life? Being a father of multiples can be taxing to say the least. But if it's a constant feeling of frustration, guilt, and isolation starts to take over, he may not have the repertory to deal with his emotional well-being adequately. Another more dangerous sign is substance abuse or thoughts of resentment towards his children or his spouse, or secretly wanting to get rid of them or hurt them. I feel like men in these dangerous situations do not have many options to turn to for help that is specific to their position. Not many doctors devote as much time and effort into learning about parents of multiples as they do to traditional single births. Helplines will probably not have a person on the other end of the line that could relate to the transition of becoming a first-time father to multiples and a provider of a suddenly large family. And without the support of peers in similar situations, because they too have never had more than one child at a time, he can begin to feel alone or even even well physically surrounded by family and friends. Many p people believe that only the mother can go through postpartum depression, but in fact, many new fathers experience symptoms of depression as well. As a society, men tend to hide their feelings from others. Therefore, some of the signs can be hidden or almost undetectable, such as slight changes in sexual desires, interests, sleeping patterns, or appetites because most of the couple's time and energy is dedicated to caring for more than one infant at a time. While others may be harder to hide, such as signs of severe depression or drastic changes in his personality. How helpful has the Twin Club contributed to the social mental out of Joe. I'm going to be honest. I was either too tired, too busy to engage in many of the assets the Twin Club provided. Aside from a few Christmas parties, trips to the zoo, and to the farm, I have not partaken in any truly beneficial events. It's it is a lot. It's lots of fun to be able to attend parties with other parents and their multiples. However, no no real deep conversations ever took place with other fathers. Many of the support groups were scheduled during the hours I was working full-time job and trying to provide for my family. I had pre 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 demotion women in the audience on anyhow. I think the twin clubs are great for for twin parents, but a father of triplets often did not feel the same sense of belonging within the club. Many of the topics and language are greeted specifically yeah. towards twins and do not take into consideration the added challenges or higher order of multiples. The vibes of resentment, even some parents of the twins give off, disheartening, they act like it's a competition when it comes to how many multiples, with each at its, at its own time and feel somehow we've won upon, one up them, and then need to find a way to dethrone or despite us. So many people in our country and province of multiple births, families, and I do believe the different levels of government should do more to equip multiple clubs by excessively training individuals, healthcare providers, and extraordinary needs of multiple birth families. These highly trained workers could then offer their support and learning at no cost to the clubs to lead workshops, workshops often discuss open discussions, support groups, play groups, peer groups, loss of one or more multiples, or written resources while traveling to different multiple clubs throughout their territories. 
I think the government could also allocate more funds towards these clubs to allow them to create and retain additional resources of their own for their specific families. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate you sharing your experience with us. This is uh, very insightful. Yeah, so just on the topic of like twin clubs, I, I was just wondering, and uh, maybe Joseph or uh, Paddy, you can answer this one. What What's the reaction to lack of support for twin clubs or triplets and higher orders? What is the reaction for, sorry? Yeah, I, uh, what are your thoughts about the lack of uh, twin clubs for uh, triplets and higher birth orders? Um, I, again, I would agree with Lindsay and John that, uh, and Joseph that there probably is not enough support because it is a unique, even, um, I, it, it hurt my heart, I guess, when you said, Joseph, that you didn't feel that there was a lot of uh, support for triplets within the twin and triplet club, because again, you're very unique within that subcategory. And so that it just adds more to that isolation that you can feel. And then as a dad, I can imagine that would add to that loneliness again for you because you didn't have anyone to relate to. Now in many clubs, it's many often the women that interact with each other, but the dads will benefit from it if they can find a, a relationship with another dad. So it's tough because the need is there, but is the population is smaller. And so there's not a lot of um, people to draw from as well. And that's where I think some of the online support might be very beneficial. Um, but then that's not that personal interaction that you have. Yeah, Lindsay and Joseph. And even when you do go to the twin club events, it's mostly like she said, the mothers that are talking and interacting and the fathers just kind of sit off to the side, kind of like a secondary person. And it makes it really hard to have any meaningful conversations or to even approach anyone at that kind of stuff, especially being a triplet father. Like there's hardly anyone else in that situation. And you almost feel like you are an outsider, even though you're at a multiples mm -hmm. event, you're still not part of the actual club because they're always twin parents and twins and twins and twins and twins this and twins that. And they don't they don't look at you the same as them, even though may, other parts of society may because they're multiples. But we get a lot of um, resentment from twins, which is really strange to us and makes us almost not want to be part of the groups. Well, yeah, I just have, have a quick question, uh, Joseph. Uh, thanks for being so transparent uh, with, with some of the things that you said. Uh, just my quick question for you is: so How do you cope, or how have you coped over the years, uh, especially in situations like when there's a happy uh, celebration of you may not be around, or if you're around, uh, you are not all by yourself, or something like that. So how, how have you been coping? Um, it's not as bad as everyone <laughs> makes it out to be. You, as a father, you just do what you got to do. You love your babies at the end of the day. You work very hard to provide for them. And yeah, I'm very strong-willed. The only regret I have is I have to work a lot to provide for them. So I'm not here a lot or as much as I want to be. But at the end of the day, I know where my heart is at and I know I'm doing the right thing for them. So coping for me isn't very hard. It just, I have a goal in life is to, two goals, take care of my house and take care of my babies. And that's the only thing that matters to me at the end of the day. Um, so coping isn't that hard when you're doing something that you want to do and you know move forward in life so i'm very strong-willed and well-prepared 
Um, I have my wife. She's super strong, super great. She takes care of the home front. I take care of the money and the work, and we come together at the end of the day, and that's it. I mean, other than that, we we know what we want to do, and we do it, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you. I hope I answered it. Yeah, you did. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I was actually just um, in this this t days that there's inflation and with all the what's going on with the economy, is the government actually doing anything to support uh, multiple families? Because um, even with people who have yeah, single singletons and have maybe more than three or four of them, it could be really difficult. So having to do like buy three boxes of diapers at the same time three cans of formula that would really be draining it's is there any like form of support from anywhere let me let, let me tell you my, my my little story uh the very first night that my twins came home and then i one thing that surprised me was to change eight diapers in the night so from a normal maybe one or two diapers I'm all the way to eight diapers and the interesting thing was that the the kids the two the twins seem to be communicating you know when one does it then the other can the other does it or as soon as you clean them up then they decide that this is what they're going to do so <laughs> it was it was it was a big a big I think change and I, uh, I just coming back to engine when you jump from two, like three uh, two and then maybe three with all the changes in, in buying diapers and oh my goodness the baby food uh, it was it was maybe the Oh yeah, Joseph and Lindsay. I think he went. He went. Um, he went silent. <laughs> anyway, Joe, uh, Joe, and uh, Lindsay have been our uh, most active participants in the Twin Fest since its beginning, and I can tell they're such wonderful parents. And I really applaud Joe. He, he was always involved, you know, he was active, always involved. And I really admire them. And on that note, I want to uh, make them happy by playing uh, our first National Multiple Best Awareness Day clip to remind them about their beautiful triplets. So let's. of the media watch um, and thank you to our sponsors for making this happen as well. 
And to our planning team and wonderful team of volunteers as well, feel free to um, register for the Pens Fest Parade. If you'd like to be part of the parade and you're a twin or a triplet or a quadruplet, um, feel free to join and to sign up. We would love to have you. on our ultrasound and we named them when they were still in our tummies. <laughs> okay. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we, we got another question here and I'm just going to put that in the chat and any of our panelists can answer this one. Um, so what's the impact of the long stay of newborns in the ICU on the parents and also family members? So I believe that it's not only the, the father and the mother who are usually impacted, but the uncles, the other siblings and grandparents can also be impacted. So any of our panelists can answer this question for us. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of all a blur now, but in the beginning, um, I almost lost Lindsay, so I was very stressed out. Um, she didn't see the babies for almost a week, and I was kind of running around like a chicken with his head cut off, um, kind of lost, empty, didn't know where to turn. Um, but when she came around, my stress level went down, and then it was just uh, work, bring milk to the babies, spend time with the babies. I would... I would even uh, uh, bring, wear button-down shirts. I would go to the hospital and drink milk for the nurses. They would call me at 3 a.m. I would bring them milk, and I would wear a button-down shirt, and I would go there, and I would go, well, I can't just drop off milk. I have to stay with them and spend some time with them, see my children. I would take them all out of their incubators at 3 in the morning. <laughs> the nurses hated me for it, and I would throw them in my shirt and have them close to me, and I would sit in a chair, from 3 a.m. till 7 a.m. when I had to go to work. And then I would get up, give them to the nurses and go to work every single day. I did that for three months straight. And by the end of it, I was a zombie. <laughs> I was literally a walking zombie. 
and um, halfway through the nurses they were like all over me at times like Joe you need to learn to do this you need to do that and I'm like oh, I thought that that's what they were there for to take care of them while they're in the hospital but then they turned around flipped it around and made me start doing stuff I was already tired <laughs> I was like yo I'm, I'm sleepy I can't do what they're, you need to learn this because you're going to have to do it on your own and I respect them for that I have a nurse there, her name was Linda, and she was all over me like crazy, teaching me things, how to bath the babies, how to change them, how to do everything, and I totally respect her for that. I think in the NICU that the nurses, when they step up and teach the parents stuff like that and show them the way how it's supposed to be, that was a deal breaker for me. That set the... So when they came home, I knew what to do. I knew how to do it. I knew when to do it. That was a deal breaker for me. Um, other than that, I wouldn't change a thing for the world. I wouldn't change nothing. It was great. Thank you. But the NICU was hard. Like hearing their sounds go off for their different alerts and this meant this, their blood pressure was falling or their heartbeat was falling. A lot of that was a lot of stress and not knowing if they were gonna survive being in the NICU. Um, that was, for me, that was really hard and not being able to be there all the time because like Joe said, I he did almost lose me at the beginning. So I was in the, in the ICU as well at the beginning and then afterwards trying to recover from a second major surgery that I had to have after the c-section to control bleeding and to stop me and save my life uh so it was really hard for me to just go there um, own it and just be with the baby so i always had to wait for joe to take me down there because that was really hard but once we Hello, I I think we, we lost, lost them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe my my screen froze. We're still here. Sorry, I just shut it off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much, and uh, that was really insightful. And uh, Auntie Flora and Uncle John, I don't know if you also want to share. I'm yeah. sure yours, yours are way older now. Yeah, probably okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I was, um, yeah. But we came as immigrants, so we were students at that time at the University of Saskatchewan. So um, one of the the girl was underweight, but we brought the boy home, and because we didn't have any support, it was very very stressful. I didn't I didn't know anybody in Canada. It was just me and my husband. I never slept. And unfortunately, my husband had a job uh, two weeks before the delivery. So after the delivery, he had to leave when Saskatoon. He had to leave for Calgary. I remember I met this lady, this white lady in uh, in the clinic when I took when I came when I was discharged. Said, "Don't be a super, don't be a super mom. Ask for help." But I was saying my I was saying to myself, "Where was I going to get help? I didn't have any help." So for immigrants, uh, the stress is is much higher because you don't have any support system and i never heard about twin clubs and even what joe said uh, what joe said said even makes it even worse because like you are you're already tired while well, i don't even have the time to take my children anywhere because i'm too tired anyways i didn't know anything about twin clubs anyways and there wasn't there was no information from the hospital to help me to get any support. The good thing was that because I didn't have anybody here in Canada, they made me stay there for, I was able to stay there for about two weeks, which was very, very helpful. Now, Canada wouldn't do that, right? But at that time, Saskatoon, because I didn't have any help, they were willing to let me stay in the hospital for two weeks. But it's very difficult for immigrants because you don't have the social network. I mean, when we came in 30 something years ago, there wasn't those kind. we didn't have anybody and it was very, very difficult. And then because we were students, I mean, and then there is financial stress as well. So you have financial stress, you have emotional stress, you have all the stresses, you have everything double, 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 double or triple, whatever. So I'm very happy that 
when I came to, when we moved here and I realized that there are twin clubs, I was very glad because at least there are people that you can share your challenges with who understand it. So I'm very happy that we have the twin clubs, but they still need to be, they still need to be resourced. You know, they need, they need people outside of themselves to be part of the twin clubs to help them because they themselves need help. So if they're just coming together, for them to support themselves. I think it is much more stressful. The government has to supply staff, you know, whether it's part-time or whether from, from, um, from the hospitals, who can actually help them, you know, who can support them emotionally and clinically. I think that's very important because we ourselves, we, we were all, all, already tired. As Joe said, you're always tired. And then you are you are supposed to go there also input into some into other multiple third families. So um, that is my experience. It was a very stressful time, but thankfully we came through and today they're all grown up. But having twins is a very very challenging experience. It's very I mean you are very very happy because it's, it's an answer to everybody. I mean like twins make you happy, but I never slept. I, I don't I remember maybe the first month I never I never slept because you were feeling like you were feeling from both breasts at the same time you know and like they were always hungry then my husband said listen especially you know, the boy we're not going to do this forever we are going to give them artificial milk you're not going to die I know so it is a very very difficult and challenging but time but um thankfully we came through and um, we are hoping that the government will actually resolve the twin clubs because it's not enough what is happening is like you are giving them more stress you know they need to be resolved i don't know what party thinks but like that's what i think should uh, I, think happen. I, I, I just i just want to make a comment i just want to make a comment on this i think that uh maybe the the other side of it should be the understanding for um grandparents and uh, in terms of the support system right the grandparents and then maybe family members who see uh, that uh, the, their family member is, is, is having a twin or a triplet i think they should come out and maybe encourage them to be more supportive uh, no i know we, we tend to say that the government Uh, those who have got uh, twins and triplets in their family, the family members come up and then, and then provide for a lot of us in the class. That is where the price comes. The challenges, yeah. Because at times it is the family members who understand and who can cope with certain things. You are breaking off. Sorry. So, so I think my, my point is that uh, maybe we need to encourage or the family members need to be encouraged, uh, whether it's grandmothers or grandfathers. Mm -hmm. You know that Lindsay's mother was always there. Remember, Lindsay, am I right? She was always in the... She was living with you, right? Lindsay, yeah, was she helped a lot when they were babies because I was pumping milk for them. So it was... Feed one baby the bottle, feed the next baby the bottle, feed the next baby the bottle, pump. Feed, then start all over again, start all over again. Like over and over. There was no time for anything else. So I am so glad that my mom was there to try to hold one while I held one. And then Joe held one. And then one we'd have to put down so I could pump. And then, oh, yeah. It's definitely that she was there helped us so much in that time. <laughs> and I would say if there's any parents out there listening that are having multiple babies rent the pumps from <laughs> Rexall they're the hospital grade pumps I rented four pumps and bought four one for each room of the house lots of pumps <laughs> lots of the bottle be prepared <laughs> amazing that is really great advice so for all those who are expecting twins uh, rent the the pumps and make sure each room of the house has a breast pump because yeah it's it's no joke and like i said i just hope that um you are being encouraged as you can see it's all perspective right 
Some people would say that because of all these challenges that come with uh, multiple pregnancies, maybe they, they don't want multiple pregnancies. But then also, like I said, if one baby gives you joy, then two or three will give you triple or double joy. So um, that is really um, important. Yeah, so um, we do have one question in the chat for Mary, and then uh, we will start wrapping up. So Mary, if you are able to help us answer this one, it says that uh, older women has higher chance for multiple birth pregnancies. Is it the same for older men as well? Okay, so I thank you for clarifying that. So what the literature says is uh, pertains more to older women because the um, we see increased rates of multiple pregnancy uh, pregnancies in older women because the older you are, uh, particularly after like age 30, and then it's even more so after age 35, um, women produce higher amounts of fol follicle um, stimulating hormone. And that hormone is what's responsible for the release of um, the egg from the fallopian tubes. And so when there's higher rates of that hormone in the body, there's an increased likelihood of releasing more than one egg. And if there's more than one egg, there's increased likelihood of more than one pregnancy. And so we see it more in men, but I, I don't think there's any literature that supports that older men are also more likely to have, um, you know, when they conceive, they're more likely to have um, babies with multiple pregnancies. Yeah, so it's related to the um, to the mother's age, not the, not the father's age. Well, that's... Sorry, I'm struggling with my baby. I'm struggling with my baby here, so I'm trying to. That's good. That's fine. <laughs> That's a cute baby. That's a very cute baby. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that's that's really encouraging, right? So if you you are here online and you've been waiting for the fruit of the womb, and yeah, you, you think that you are getting older and you are worried. Guess what? The older you get, the more your chances of multiple pregnancy. So. <laughs> You're probably going to get double for all the trouble, all the years waiting, and just keep on holding on. So we just want to wrap up. Um, if there are any questions, uh, still feel free to put them in the chat. But I think essentially what we are seeing here today is that um, usually the fathers are overlooked when it comes to multiple pregnancies. So let us all, as um, Lindsay and Joseph talked about, Twin birth, multiple birth needs lots of support. So if you know anyone expecting multiples, please step up and see how you can support them one way or the other. That would be really helpful. Not only those who are expecting, but if you know people who have also lost um, one or two because of uh, multiple pregnancies, they also need our support as well. Let's also encourage them. And like uh, Paddy said, encourage them to name it, right? So the name of the baby, talk about the baby, it's okay to share. It's okay because you never really get over it. You just um, continue to move on with the resilience that you build. So let's reach out to twin fathers, multiple fathers, encourage them because just as everyone is aware of uh, postpartum depression for mothers, we seem to overlook the fathers but they also might be Ikwe, we lost you. Hello. Hello. Okay. We lost you briefly. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So I was just saying that uh, multiple birth fathers are also going through a lot. So let's remember to reach out to them and see how we can support them any way possible. So I'll hand over to um, Auntie Flora. She give us the closing remarks and then we'll call it a day. Thank you so much for your participation. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Akria. Oh, you are muted, Antifora. Muted. Oh, sorry. Thank you all for your participation, especially our panelists and uh, moderator. Um, I hope that we will share this information with um, people who I mean, are expecting um, multiples and 
the their network because usually the networks are very, very important whether they are families or their friends uh, we need to engage all these people to make life a bit more bearable for um, multiple birth families i also like to call on zina to give us um, the vote of thanks yeah um, hold on this one of our young um, so I'd like to give a vote of thanks. Uh, you will all agree that the stellar presentations and discussions by our distinguished panelists are the upshot of their expertise and hard work with the engaging support of this wonderful audience. Audience, you have all been great. Let's show our appreciation by clicking the round of applause icons. Thank you. When planning an event such as this, it is imperative to gain the participation of experts in the field. The willingness of our panelists, Patty Walker, Mary Alukatun, and Joel and Lindsay Diprose to share their time and expertise in the area of mental well-being for multiple births families, especially fathers, was a critical success to this hypothesis. We think of we thank you all very much and appreciate you for carving time out of your busy practices to participate. We were also fortunate to have a great moderator, Dr. Ikuyu Agiyamang, to navigate us flawlessly through, the, through it all. Fielding information, seeking questions, challenge questions, and comments that fed greater insight into the topic on multiple births, families, and mental health. Thank you very much. It is our collective efforts and thoughts on best practices that will bring us closer to resolving this important issue on the mental well-being of multiple births families. This symposium is not meant to be a single event, but a continuing work that must be done to mitigate this problem more effectively. Last but not least, we would like to acknowledge our funding partners, the Alberta Government, Edmonton Arts Council, and Amerly Treb Books. We very much appreciate your financial support. A big shout out to our volunteers who made introductions, note takers, Zoom and chat room managers. Please be sure to visit us at www.tkofcd.org and register to receive updates, connect and support this initiative. Celebrate 2023 Twin Fest with us at Millwoods Town Center on May 26th and May 27th, which will run during the mall hours, featuring Twin Cultures exhibition with a variety of family-centered activities. We still need volunteers, so if you're, so you are welcome to sign up at twinstriplettsfest.org or send an email to ttpfp.paradecomm at gmail.com. Once again, thank you all very much for your participation in this important symposium from the board and volunteers at TKOFCD and TwinFest Edmonton. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much, Zina. And that brings us to the close of our 2023 conference. I hope you all enjoyed it very much and we're all going a bit to be more helpful. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Long time no see. <laughs> Good to see you again. Hi. Remember me? <laughs> We're too young. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And enjoy your long weekend. We hope that the smoke will disappear in Edmonton. That we have some rains and things will clear up so that we can enjoy our long weekend. So thank you very much. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful long weekend. Thank you.